All right, we'll give a few moments for everyone to log in here. Thank you for everyone joining. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the MediaGel podcast, where we cover the latest in marketing trends and strategies that are most effective in growing your cannabis dispensary, delivery service, or brand. MediaGel connects brands and retailers with cannabis consumers through our ad network of publishers, mobile apps, games, and TV. We help cannabis companies advertise through paid search, through SEO, and through programmatic display advertising to drive e-commerce sales. I am your host, Guillermo Bravo. Today, we'll be discussing how to determine a cannabis company's valuations and multiples with BridgeWest CPAs. BridgeWest is one of the first accounting firms in the world to focus solely on the cannabis industry since 2009. The practice has expanded more than 600 cannabis and hemp clients nationwide. They work with all types of organizations that provide uh, legal recreational cannabis, medical marijuana, low THC, and high CBD products, hemp farming, and ancillary services. First up, I'd like to introduce Corey Parnell, who is the COO of Bridge West. He has 25 years of experience working with business owners and senior management to develop strategic business plans, deal with complex tax and accounting issues, implement best practices, and increase shareholder value. Corey has been involved in the cannabis industry since 2014, and as one of the leaders of Bridge West, he assists in managing the firm's cannabis team to provide exceptional client customer service. Uh, His technical and advisory services uh, to cannabis clients range from minimizing the effects of uh, IRS 280E, which we all know about, inventory, inventory management, inventory costing, cash management, and preparing financial statements. Next up, I'd like to introduce Calvin Shannon. Calvin is the president of Bridge West and has over 20 years of experience providing tax and audit services. With a deep understanding of the challenges of, uh, that cannabis clients are facing, Can- Calvin is skilled at working with them to develop and implement innovative solutions. Calvin assists cannabis businesses in addressing the industry's unique and ever-evolving issues. He enjoys working with clients to understand their business needs and provide timely solutions. In addition to being a a certified public accountant, Calvin is accredited in business valuation as well. Welcome uh, to the show, gentlemen. How are you both? Good. Thank you very much, Guillermo, for the um, introduction. And we're, we're excited to have this opportunity to have this discussion Likewise, we're excited to have you aboard. Well, let's kick it off uh, from the top. Why, uh, why would a cannabis company need evaluation in the first place? Yeah, I, I, I guess I'd answer that question in uh, um, kind of listing out uh, a lot of the common, re- common requests that we get when e- either current or, or sometimes future potential clients calling us asking about valuation services. Um, what the reasons are for that. And they'll just kind of list out the, the a laundry list of common ones and, and maybe make a couple of comments about some of them. Um, one, one common is, is ownership is considering, obviously ownership is considering a, a sale of, of a business or a partial interest in a, in a business. <clears throat> uh, valuing equity compensation uh, I, I say very recently, we, we've seen more and more inquiries regarding 409A valuations, which, you know, that relates to uh, um, stock options, which is a form of equity compensation. Often, uh, um, it could be litigation driven. Um, maybe there's minority shareholder disputes or uh, um, shareholder ownership buyout disputes. Uh, a lot, a lot of times around insurance claims for lost revenue or, or decrease in value of a business, um, maybe the you know a fire or, or whatever, and the the license holder is is uh, you know trying to come to terms with the insurance company for, with what the what the settlement will be. Um, buy sell agreements, uh, which are agreements that owners of a business entity have um, that kind of lays out the terms of what a buyout would look like, which are always a good idea by that's kind of a separate conversation. But a lot of times these buy-sell agreements will, will have language 
um, indicating that um, in, in the event of a buyout that uh, a, uh, a third party um, business valuation professional would, would, would provide a report to arrive at a value and then that would drive the buyout. Um, a lot of times in, in cannabis, there's, there's change in business structure, especially, you know, at the, this phase of the game. Um, and then sometimes you would need valuations for, for tax purposes. Some of the, what, what I would say, uh, one least common need for, for business valuation in cannabis is more so in, in more traditional clients is, is estate and gift taxes. And the reason I would say that is especially estate just because of the, um, you know, the industries that mature. So as more time goes by and, and people end up, you know, the seatons that own, uh, own an interest and in would potentially have to file a gift tax return would need evaluation for that purpose. Or if they're doing some estate planning, like I said, and looking to maybe push some stuff in the trust or, or whatever other the, the estate plan that, that they may be wanting to, uh, to implement that they, they may need to file gift tax returns which would require if they you know own an interest in a uh, a privately held company would require a business valuation um then uh, uh you, you know the, i guess the last area is, is around gap or ifers financial reporting some entities would require financial statements and if they're have had business combinations or equity-based compensation a lot of times they, they would need business valuations to comply with their reporting requirements. Um, you know, maybe uh, Corey, is there I don't know, anything additional that, that you'd run into that are maybe I forgot to discuss? No, I, I, I can't think of any. And it's, I, I think we get inquiries of all those different buckets all the time. Um, and uh you're just making me think, and the one that uh, kind of ebbs and flows is, you know, the transactions, you know, the, we, we've seen a lot of transactions in the last two years. Um, uh, therefore, um, we continue to do that. Um, someone just pinged, and uh, in fact, I think we're working on right now, uh, tied around capital raise. Um, every, everywhere from the initial startup um, through additional rounds. Um, so that is another area that we, we do uh, help clients through that process. So um, thanks for pinging that. Appreciate the support. Yeah, and specific, yeah, your, your comment around the, the capital raise, I kind of glossed over and just, you know, indicated ownership considering sale or par, uh, business or partial interest. But that really drives a lot of it. They're looking to bring in some outside money and both parties are looking at each other saying, how, how on earth do we value what we're willing to come in and uh, come in at, so. Exactly. And what is the standard of value and why is it that, why is that important? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the standard of value, what I would say, that's how value is being defined for, for when you're valuing the company, um, which is critically important. It, a lot of times when, when we're first talking with, with a client about, um, they, they, they say they need an evaluation, and this is the first place that we're going to go, we're, we're going to ask, you know, what, the, what is the purpose of the valuation? Because that'll drive what the standard of value is. And, and as I talk about um, what some of these different standards of values are, um, that, that, that'll become more obvious. But w without knowing what this is up front, and obviously the, would be disclosed in, in an engagement letter, um, between the valuation professional and the client. Um, sometimes there can be a one thing that the valuation may not achieve the purpose of, of what the, the client had engaged, engaged us to do. Um, and then e e even more so the, the client's idea of what the value is if they're not looking at defining it correctly may really not meet their expectations. So like I said, it, it's important to understand and it's important to understand and make sure everyone's on the same page up front. So maybe with that, I'll, I'll talk about what a couple of the different standards of value or the definition of what value is. Um, the first one is, is certainly the most common and it's from uh, Revenue Ruling 5960, which, which is a tax issue. Basically, it, it, it's fair market value and fair market value is defined as the amount 
at which the property would change hands between a willing, willing buyer and a willing seller when the former is not under compulsion to buy and the latter is not under compulsion to sell, both parties having reasonable knowledge of the relevant facts. So I just read uh, I, the, the literal definition from, from the revenue ruling. Um, this is a definition that that's most all the time used for IRS or tax purposes. And then honestly, otherwise, a, a lot of times, ju just the, the default definition, um, it's because it's what a, a lot of uh, valuation practitioners are used to and comfortable. It's certainly what I'm more used to and comfortable with. Uh, and it, it maybe just one additional con or kind of a summary of, of the fair market value is, is, is it assumes um, basically a hypothetical arms leak sale um, without regard to specific buyer or seller. And I want to emphasize this uh, without regard to specific buyer or seller to, contra to contrast that with the, um, with the investment or strategic value, which is, you know, I'll kind of transition into talking about that. It, basically, the investment strategic value is the value of an asset or business to a specific owner or prospective owner and with the idea that this specific owner, prospective owner, has specific ideas of what's gonna, what they're going to do with the business, um, it has specific expectations with regard to risk, uh, pro probably some uh, business motivation, and maybe with that we'll we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, so, and I'm sure every you and everyone else has heard of you know some of these relatively larger. Um, values or, and, and amounts that have been bought for, for license holders all over the country. So the question is, is, was that a fair market value standard that these buyouts happen or was it probably more an investment or strategic value because the buyer was maybe there in MSO that are operating in other states and they're looking at to enter into this market for a specific purpose. So maybe they would have paid more than what the fair market value is because they had some strategic reason to do so. Um, if, the, uh, oh, go ahead, Corey. No, well, were you going to continue on that? I, I was just going to say, you know, you probably want to touch base on, you know, they're in doing the valuation work, you, all the valuators have rules that they have to follow. So when you're talking about a strategic um, valuation, that's kind of, a, I'd say almost like an outlier. Um, so for example, in Florida, because there's limited number of licenses, we've seen a license uh, in the marketplace sell for 50 million when there's really no assets, there's nothing operating. It's just that you're buying your way into a marketplace for a strategic purpose or um, versus fair value of what you were just talking about before. There's, there's rules that all business valuation um, experts have to follow. Correct. Specifically, you know, as long as you're going down the fair market value standard, you have this hypothetical um, buyer and seller, as opposed, like you said, this, this strategic value. And, and again, that's why it's important to have this conversation up front with the, uh, with the potential client and explain this to them. Cause otherwise they, you know, they just, you know, read an article that this person, you know, this license got sold with uh, no activity whatsoever for 20 million or no, not operational. It's just the license got sold for $20 million. So there's like, Oh, why I'm worth $20 million too. I'm like, well, you know, we, we need to have this conversation as far as what is really how you're defining value and how is it relevant to the purpose that, that you're getting the valuation for you know yeah, a couple oh go ahead i was going to say really just setting those expectations up front you know i know there's a lot of a lot of noise in the media of these crazy valuations for tech companies same thing with msos uh and it really just depends on the market and there's really no there's no concrete way to say hey this is what you're worth it's really what someone's going to pay right? exactly yeah. exactly again it 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 depends on strategic, the real purpose of it. And it might be strategic that you're, you know, you know, you have a limited license and you're trying to maximize the value of that to a strategic buyer um, before the market potentially changes, which most of markets do evolve and change over time. Yeah. I mean, for, for example, on my side, I applied for a license here in Santa Rosa. We had a cap at 16. So we had a, 
you know, valuation of one to two million dollars for that license. If you get that store operational, it's a different valuation. Uh, if it's a profitable business, different valuation, and then they got rid of the cap. So now there's an unlimited amount of dispensaries opening in this area. So that just crushed the valuation. It, valuation changed no, pretty quick. Yeah. Then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, a couple other standards of value or again, definitions of value. Um, it, it's fair value. What I would say fair value for court purposes and, you know, this is a little harder to talk about. Basically, let's say maybe it's every state will have different laws and, you know, possibly we'd be engaged to do evaluation. An attorney is dealing with a client that they have a minority rights issue and, and they need a value because they're trying to, to, to work with their client to, to get a buyout. Um, if you're looking at what the value is or how to define value in that situation, a lot of times the, the, the different states will have different laws as far as how you go about doing the value, the valuation, in which case you have to look at those laws and understand what that's going to mean for the value. For example, a lot of times maybe states will say that you do or don't exclude um, discounts, uh, minority ownership discounts or marketability discounts to arrive at the value. So it's just, you know, you got to be careful to, to really pay attention to, to what's going on there. A lot of times if we were, you know, we'd be actually engaged directly by the attorneys and that would be the first conversation I have is, you know, can you help me understand exactly what, how, how, how the, where the jurisdiction that, that you're working in, how, how they define value for the purposes of, of this particular litigation. And then the last is fair value for a gap definition. And that goes, you know, back to earlier, I, I had mentioned that uh, one of the reasons that, that some people may need evaluations for financial reporting purposes, and then that's where this particular definition would fit in. Um, and I'll read the, the, the definitions, the price that would be received to sell an asset or pay to transfer liability in an orderly transaction between market participants and measurement date. So that's kind of a, kind of a layout of, of the different standards of value and why it's, why it's important to, to make sure to understand upfront, uh, you know, what, what your goals are and, and, and what you're trying to achieve with the valuation, make sure everyone's on the same page. And it, it's interesting you bring up the example about, uh, you know, when there were limited licenses, pre, uh, just the license, the operational. Um, so, I mean, that, that is another conversation that we do have with, with clients when they're entering or in a, in a market. And we have one client that I think this will be their third market that they've gone in there, won a license, got it up and running and sold. Um, that's, that's their strate strategy. Yeah. So... Yeah, and really, you know, thank you, gentlemen, for kind of setting the uh, setting the tone on, you know, the different the different reasons uh, that you'll need evaluation. Uh, you know, given given that and kind of defining all the all the the details there, like how is evaluation performed? Let's yeah. dive in deep into the meat. Yeah. Yeah, this is, you're right, it's kind of the meat of the conversation. Um, maybe I'd start, start out with how evaluation is formed. Basically, at a high level, evaluation prof professionals is going to gather relevant information um, about the, the, the entity being valued, and then considering that information to inform um, the calculation using basically three commonly used approaches. That, that, that's at a high level how evaluation would be performed. And you know what information is considered when uh, in that process? Yeah, you, you know, I, I, I like to say a, a evaluation is both art, uh, both an art and a science. And there are many factors that go into developing the value of a business. I say they fall into two main groups: tangible factors and intangible factors. The tangible factors, which, you know, I myself as an accountant love to deal with more, that's obviously, you know, the, the financial information, you know, what the assets and, li and liabilities of the entity that's being valued, um, what, what are the, what's the income statement look like, what are the operating results of the, of the entity that's being valued, that's, you know, a whole lot easier to deal with, and, and you know, that, that's the science of evaluation. Now, 
the the more difficult the intangible factors you know where, where the, the the art of it comes in um that's a, a whole list of things you know obviously you have to consider the strengths and the wit weaknesses of the entity being valued the management structure um, the competitive advantages and disadvantages that the entity has relative to to its competitors um you have to uh you know, understand the industry so cannabis specific obviously there's a whole bunch to understand it's new um it's it's still from the from the federal government's perspective high thc is still federally illegal um there's accordingly some you know relatively steep tax um ramifications of that with code section 280e we'll talk a little bit later about um the the cash flow or benefit stream that, that's being valued but j j you know just to comment there that uh, obviously you know, a, a large amount of tax being reduced or larger amount of tax than, than a traditional company being reduced from the cash flow is certainly going to impact the uh, um, impact the value. Um, you know, we've talked some about uh, uh, limited number of licenses in, in, in a jurisdiction uh, where, where the license holder may, may be. That can definitely impact the value. So as far as industry goes with, with, in cannabis, it's a, a long list of considerations that that you have to look at, and then e even beyond that, just uh, um, the, the 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 general in economic environment, you know, in the area that's that's being operated, and even nationwide, and you know, that's separate from cannabis. Is is uh, are, are we in a uh, in a recession, which if it, let's say it's a retail, that very well could mean that, you know, it could impact what, what the future cash flows are, because, you know, customers would, would it'd be less customers or the customers there could potentially have less disposable income. Um, or, or maybe on the other direction, maybe uh, um, like we're dealing with right now, there's uh, somewhat of a labor shortage that certainly impacts the, the cannabis industry as well, because you got to have um, employees to, you know, work in the dispensaries or, or the production facilities. So that's kind of a look at the types of information that uh, that a, that a evaluate, evaluator would, would be considered when doing a evaluation. Wonderful, and you know, uh, based on the the information provided at, you know, to perform evaluation, what approaches uh, you know, are used when valuing a cannabis company? Yeah. So there's, there's three traditional approaches um, to, va to, to, va to value a company that, that are to value privately held companies. Um, and I'll list them off and then I'll go into a little more, more detail or actually a couple of them, a lot more detail, but it's the asset approach, the income approach, and the market approach. So that's every valuation, you really should look at it uh, under these three approaches and then, um, you know, consider wh which approach is, is uh, uh, more relevant. Maybe use a combination and you come to values using both of them and or, or a couple different ones and then, and then arrive at a value that way. Maybe under the best case circumstances, the two of them happen to agree and then you get even more comfort with, with the value that you arrived at. So, but with that, um, you know, I'll talk the, the asset approach uh, that that's a calculates the value of a business or business ownership interest by determining the value of its assets, net of its liabilities. And this approach is generally used to value non-operating businesses and would provide a minimum value for operating companies. So what I mean by that is, is if an entity is just holding maybe some some or, or some real estate, it, it just owns a strip mall and and that's all it does. It doesn't have any activity. You would probably come to the value of that by coming up with the fair market value of the real estate it owns, backing out what whatever mortgage is is there is against that real estate, and then you you have the value of, of that business, um, which is distinct from a business that's operating, which you, you know most license holding companies are you know operating dispensaries or or uh, production companies. So the asset approach wouldn't be used for that, but one of the the, the latter two approaches that that I'll discuss a little more would, would probably be used for that. Um, the, the, the first one, which I'll talk about more than any other, because for the cannabis industry, uh, the, the, this is certainly the, the, the most prevalent one is the income approach. So the income approach determines the value 
of indication of a business ownership interest security or intangible asset using one or more methods that convert anticipated benefit stream and anticipate and it, maybe I'll stop there and you know define anticipated benefit stream as basically cash flow that's eventually going to come to the owners from the earnings so the, the idea is it's, it converts this anticipated this future cash flow stream into a present value amount and that is what uh um that, that that's what a potential um investor that's the whole thing that they're buying is is what you know by owning this business it's going to operate in the future it's going to generate this cash flow and then eventually it's going to come to me and, and that's my return on my investment and we're going to talk a whole lot more about that the income approach value is determined by methods that discount or capitalize net future cash flow as i discussed before by a discount or capitalization rate that reflects market rate of expectations market conditions and relative risk of investment so I, you know, I mentioned two two different subsets in the income approach, basically. And by the way, there's a, a number of others, but I'm just going to focus on I'd say two of the two of the more common. Um, one of them is the capitalization approach, um, which uses expected ongoing net cash flow for a single period to convert it into um, the value of of uh, the, the future cash flow using a capitalization rate. And the capitalization rate is a discount rate less the long-term expected growth rate. Uh, the capitalization rate is used by entities whose cash flow isn't expected to vary significantly from year to year. So may maybe in summary, what the capitalization rate is, you look at one year and then you're, you're basically, you're capitalizing it, which taken at times a multiplier. And that's what the value is. That's useful if the future the future is going to be somewhat similar or, or, you know, have like a steady growth stream from, from the, the, the year that you're capitalizing as opposed to, which is the case a lot of times in this industry, because the industry is in a growth phase. Um, that's probably less relevant and you would probably need to use a discounted cash flow method, which you project out what the future cash flows are with all the changes that are going to happen out into the future. And then you discount that back. So you, it, it's really under both approaches, you should come to the same answer. The capitalization approach is maybe a shortcut if you don't if you don't expect to be you know significant fluctuation in the in the future cash flows going on to the future. But to the extent you do, you are going to have a lot of changes, that, then you're kind of restricted to using the discounted cash flows and actually discounting or detailing those out. Yeah, and again, I I. Uh probably talking about that normally it's going trying to uh, going out five years of uh, performance and um, I know someone asked about the startup uh, kind of same thing you have to make your best estimate normally what we'll see in a startup you'll have 12 to 18 months of uh, getting the license getting ready for operational start building uh, market penetration uh, but that's where what Calvin was talking about earlier um, what what is the management team experience in this? What does the market analysis look like? And one of the things that we, we think we're pretty good at is being able to assess uh, the, you know, do the metrics make sense, the, the cost goods sold, the operating expenses, how much your um, balance sheet, what that should look like, inventory turns and so forth, market, market conditions from a competitive standpoint, and really assessing and, and working through with management on that five-year forecast. Um, so that's one area that it it's, takes a lot of time and thought uh, process to go through that. And uh, whether you're existing in a current operator, it's still about the forecast, as well as if you're a startup, it's a similar process. Um, and that's where Calvin I was talking about the discount you'd have a higher discount if you're a startup because it's a higher risk. But versus if you were operating for four years and you're just doing a, um, cult you're adding to your cultivation manufacturing, you're going to double the size because of uh, went legal. Um, then you'd be forecasting that. And um, again, what, what have you seen in other, what have we seen in other marketplaces market opportunity and growth within that uh, market. 
So all, all those factors uh, really come into play and take a lot of conversation around that to for everyone to be comfortable, especially if you're raising money and if you're if you're using that as a basis because uh, I'd say the um, investor groups out there have become a lot more sophisticated in the area of cannabis and really um, uh, really um, getting better understanding of uh, markets, the evolution, and, and especially with the publicly traded companies providing some uh, benchmarks and numbers out there. And I think yeah. someone... Oh, yeah. go ahead, Corey. Oh, uh, again, I'm, I'm Corey and my partner Calvin uh, has the headset on that's speaking. Someone just asked which one's which. I wouldn't even pay attention to the question. So <laughs> good thing you are. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Uh, Calvin, you know, since you're accredited in business valuation, you know, what, what are some of the services uh, you know, that a valuation professional would provide? Well, I guess I was thinking, can yeah. we can we talk a little bit more about yeah. the, the 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 approaches? Just uh, especially um, the the income approach, because there's yeah. like I said, this is going to be the most common and really, um, um, you know, probably important in our system. Maybe I'll just make make a couple more comments. You know, even yeah. expand on a couple of things that Corey had mentioned, um, which I would categorize put it in two different buckets you know the first thing is is what 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 are the 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 future cash flows you know Corey mentioned something going out like five years that that, that that's pretty customary um i was going to make a couple comments um about that uh this idea of what the future cash flows are, which is difficult, right? It's you're, you're trying to look at a crystal ball and figure it out. But again, that that's, what's critically important because a buyer, they're not buying the historical results. They're buying what, what the future cash flows are going to be. So, or, or this potential buyer. So, um, the, you know, that's critical to try to, to, to pin that. And that, that's what I would say, you know, the, the first step of trying to do the income approach, and then even after you do that, and Corey, you know, started to, to make reference to this as well, um, you, you have to figure out what this discount or capitalization rate, which I would, def I, I, maybe I'd, I'd define that as a, what the required rate of return an investor would expect given the specific, um, the risk specific to the entity and the industry, in the industry being valued. And this kind of goes to the point of all, you know, all the risk to ADE, federally legal. And you know, the, the listeners then, you know, maybe has questions. Well, can you give me some idea of what the, um, what the uh, uh, required rate of return or the, the discount rates may be? So I was going to kind of lay out and kind of build up um, just to, just to, to paint a picture of what this would look like. Um, and to start out with, let's say if you were going to invest in some U S government debt, which is, about as unrisky a thing to invest in that, that you can, you'd probably expect a rate, you know, somewhere between two and 3%, which is uh, probably going up as we speak right now, but still yeah, relatively, uh, relatively light. But, you know, to contrast that to, let's say you, you were going to invest in, in a large publicly traded company like Microsoft or 3M, someone that's diverse and, and their, their, their stock is publicly traded, it's easy to get rid of. You're, it's more risk than associated with the, the government debt, but um, still relatively, you know, low risk. You, you, maybe you expect something like a 9% rate of return um, for that type of investment. Um, so now step that up to a little bit more risky, a, a small publicly traded company, maybe it's thinly traded and it's certainly less uh, diverse in, in its activities than, than one of the larger public companies, then a little bit more risky, maybe you'd expect something like a 14% um, rate of return. So now I'll jump to a stable privately held company, which the rate jumps up a little bit there. A lot of that has to do with the fact that if you want to liquidate your, your position, it's obviously a lot holder. There's not a public, a lot harder. There's not a public market for it. And then additionally, obviously a smaller company is just more risk than that. Let's, I'll give an example, like a dental office. Um, you know, it's, it's confined to obviously just a, uh, a geographic area uh, of potential clients, 
um, as far as, you know, potential employees and things like that. So a little bit more risk, maybe you'd expect 16 to 20. And I do all this build up to arrive at um, what uh, a potential investor's um, expected rate of return would be for a cannabis company or a privately held cannabis company, which is obviously for, you know, a lot of the reasons that we, uh, um, that, that we've been discussing is significantly more risky. And honestly, that rate of return, you, you would expect somewhere between between 25 and 40% is a lot of times what we've issued valuation reports at as well as, you know, I've seen that consistent with, with a lot of other professionals. So, and I, you know, I've always spent a lot of time talking about this idea of, of rate of return, but it's really critical because that's what's going to drive the value. Um, and, and uh, often the, and the higher the rate of return is, the required return, the less the value on, on the future cash flows are, which is a lot, you know, the reason I'm having this conversation is, is a lot of times it's surprising and even disappointing to clients, but, you know, I, it's necessary to, to make sure they understand why. So I guess that's, uh, um, you know, my last couple of comments about the income approach, I haven't actually mentioned the third approach, which is the market approach. Um, and so maybe I'll make a couple comments about that. So, so the market approach is, is another approach where, but what you're looking at is, is uh, value, value or the price that similar securities have sold at in some sort of relevant time frame. So the, the most prominent example is, let's say 30 days before the valuation date, the same company had sold or, or there was transactions of the same company stock. Well, that's probably a really good indication of value because somebody literally just bought the stock at that price. So that, that that's probably really going to be an indication of what the value is 30 days later. Now, the, the, the valuation professional has to consider as more and more time goes on since, since uh, this transaction date, you know, how relevant that information is. And that's something you have to look at on a case by case basis. Then uh, another way to look at the market approach is to the extent that uh, there's some good relevant information about um, similar companies. Uh, so, so let's say if you, you knew a dispensary, um, you know, in town, you know what they sold were what they sold for and what their revenue was or, or their EBITDA was, you could use that same uh, multiplier and apply it to your situation. Now, the, the one thing comment that I would make around the market approach is, and again, since the, the industry is relatively, um, is relatively early or relatively new, there's not a lot of good information, A, and then B, to the extent there is, let's say you're, you're trying to use a, a sale that happened in California and compare that with a sale that happened in a uh, a state with with, with um, restricted licenses, they're absolutely not comparable. Um, it, an entity that sells in uh, New, New Jersey, it's just not going to, it's not going to have the same multiplier as what a, a California or like, basically every state, state in every jurisdiction, you need to look closely to, to the facts and circumstances to make sure you're, you're really comparing apples to apples. So sorry to jump backwards on your gear mode, but I wanted to oh, make sure to, to finish out the answer on, uh, on that question. There's a lot, a lot of, Calvin, I think a couple of times, um, in, in the court, they've accepted that discount rate, uh, ends up being a higher one. Um, Definitely. so that, that, that's what we've seen in the court system where we're, we've done the valuation work as well. Um, and then the other thing just, I, I guess how I always look at, you know, the discount rate is um, 25% uh, return is really four years of cash flow that you're willing to invest in and, and get a 25% in a four year. If it's 33%, that's three years of cash flow, 50%, then it's two years of cash flow. So that's kind of how I look at it. And again, um, you know, just depending on the stage you're at as startup, you're going to have a very high um, rate of return because there's higher risk with no uh, operating history. Um, you can, uh, when Calvin was talking about uh, um, experienced management team, have they done this before is within the industry? Is this just another round versus we've seen groups where 
this is the, they've got the real estate, they've got some other manufacturing background, they're gonna get into this, they're gonna find a cultivator, run it, higher risk versus if it's a team that did this in Colorado and they're Massachusetts doing it um, for round two or round three, um, the, the, they've got a playbook that they're gonna follow versus creating a playbook as they go along. Absolutely, that's a great, great comments. Agreed. Great. And thank you for going into so much detail in regards to the difference between the asset income and market approaches. I mean, I've seen, uh, I've seen all these, uh, in variations kind of over my time and, you know, uh, a lot of the, the talk of entrepreneurship and, and disposable income is really that income approach, right? It's, well, we want that money coming in every month. We, we want those checks coming in. We know what the, the net is on the business and we expect those to come over the next you know, future cash flows over the next five years. So it's, thank you for breaking yeah. that down for us. Yeah. Yeah. Calvin, there's a question. I'm not sure I, I, I get it right away, but it, how does acquisition of debt financing affect valuations? Um, well, that, that's a, that's a great question. And I'll maybe just rattle on a little bit and talk about the different types of ways that, that, that it could impact it. Um, so I mean, let's go with some assumption that the, the debt financing was was used to, to obviously acquire some production assets and the exact right amount of debt financing, um, what, what was was received. And it was, you know, the, the, the exact right amount of uh, production assets were acquired. And then those production assets were then, you know, turned around and you put in production to, to generate cash flow. The debt financing basically, and you know, this goes back to when I said earlier, the we're looking at the value of the future cash flow and discounting that back to a current rate. So this debt financing from its, its debt repayments as well as its interest repayments are both going to reduce these future cash flows, which would then reduce the value um, or, or reduce the future cash flows, which leaves then less value um, for the entity. So it's like, well, why take debt financing? Well, you did that. You know, so I kind of kept going on about it was used to acquire assets in the, 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 the you know, the exact correct amount and, and these assets are producing cash flow. You wouldn't have had this extra cash flow in the first place if you wouldn't have had this debt. So basically the debt's going to reduce, um, reduce the net cash flow down to, to, uh, um, the, the cash flow after ba basically the debt service payments. And then that's the, that's the, uh, um, the, the cash flow that that's going to be discounted to arrive at, at your uh, value. That's a okay. great question. Yeah. So Calvin, that, that's what we we're just looking at one last week for a client. They were going for round two, um, a potential tranche of finance or funding and they're trying to determine if they're going to do it through debt financing or equity. Um, and still, unfortunately, the, the interest rate and the warrants tied to it all had to be taken into consideration. So it was like 12% interest rate plus a bunch of warrants uh, compare, trying to compare. And then that, how that impacts the um, future cash flow or, or the present value of that cash flow versus the cost of the equity um versus and not doing debt financing so that that's uh sure we just went through that analysis yep. wonderful and uh now getting to 49a uh, this is something that uh well, i have a lot of experience the, oh, the, uh, it, but before i had yeah. uh started railing on more about the income approach you were going to ask about i think you started to ask about the the services oh. that valuations provide and so, sorry course, about yeah. sorry about interrupting you on that one go ahead go ahead um, yeah yeah so circling back on the business valuation and you know the type of services that someone like yourself would provide yeah um so basically there's different levels of service and this is you know going to drive the, the the cost and how long it takes to, to get the service done the highest level is is where we would write a report and literally provide an opinion we would say this is our opinion 
of what the value or range of value is as of a certain date. Um, that this, for, for obvious reason, is, is more costly. Um, in order to do so using our, our professional standards, we have to, to, to check a bunch of boxes, go through a bunch of steps, um, consider all the approaches you know, that, that we had discussed quite a bit earlier in our conversation. Um, you know, a step down from that is what's called a calculation engagement, and that's um, less in scope. And it, it, most of the time that, you know, that would, uh, we, we derive at that, you know, I'd be having a conversation with, with a potential new client, and we determined that a calculation engagement would work for them, meaning that, you know, they weren't going to be going to court or they didn't need it for IRS purposes. They just want to internally figure out what their value is for two owners to buy each other out. And it's a, not a contentious situation, um, in which case, you know, I would probably have this conver similar conversation to what we had right now, right? Talk about the different approaches and way, what may or may not work and, and the things to consider. And then we would agree on these approaches. Um, and then I would go off and basically do it, do this calculation and put it on our letterhead in a letter, but clearly say we're not providing an opinion because we haven't gone through all this other work. Then, then the last option is what I call consulting engagements, where we're not going to be issuing anything, not even a calculation engagement on our letterhead, but rather <clears throat> just assisting um, maybe a client with so, some of the components of what being evaluation, maybe would help and give some advice on that they're trying to come up with some prospective financial information for the purposes of discounting it back, or maybe a, a client's, you know, they're doing their own valuation and they want to try to understand what the EBITDA multiplier or, or the discount rates could be. And, and you know, we, we may just have that conversation and, and help them understand and give some ideas of what that could be. So at any rate, I just wanted to make sure to answer that question that you had started and I interrupted of course. for. Oh, no, no problem. Thank you for, for clarifying that, Calvin. Uh, and then transitioning to the 409A valuation, you know, what is this and, and why is it important? Yeah, so 409A is, is basically a framework that privately held companies can use when granting private stock options. Um, so on, on, under code section 409A, equity-based awards need to be issued at or above the fair market value at the grant date to, to avoid some tax consequences. So um, then, you know, obviously the, the, the client, the taxpayers left like, well, okay, how do we make sure that the IRS doesn't come in and say that what, what we issued at that, which we think is, is uh, um, what was at or above the fair market value, the IRS doesn't come in and do their own determination and say it was less and, and you know, torpedo the, the, whole, the whole plan. Um, basically, and the answer is the 409A regulations. Um, under the 409A regulations, companies have options to obtain um, what's called a safe harbor valuation. And one of those approaches, one of those safe harbor valuations is basically the, the independent appraisal method, which is go getting a, 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 qual a qualified and emphasize qualified independent um, appraiser to do a business valuation. And then, you know, maybe jumping forward a little bit, well, what, what, what is different about this 409A valuation than, than uh, what we've been talking about, you know, up to, the, up to this point in the conversation? And not a lot other than um, one difference that I'll maybe talk about in a second. The the 409A valuation, you know, it's a tax valuation. So again, it's going to use the fair market value standard, which is, you know, how we defined, we talked about that definition quite a bit earlier. Um, it, it'll go through all the approaches that, that we talked about earlier. Oh, everything's the same. But then uh, a lot of times the 409 evaluation, once it arrives at what the enterprise value is, or, you know, the value of the entire entity, then it would need to do some additional work to allocate those values across a, a capitalization table, um, specifically for the, the like the stock options. You know that those stock options are going to have some portion of the total value. So you need to do some more work to, to arrive at what the, the value of those stock options are. And so that's kind of my uh, high-level description of what a four hundred nine a is and. 
and uh, um, when and how it would be necessary. I don't know, Corey, do you have some some thoughts that maybe I, I didn't cover? No, I, I, I don't think so. I think on a 409A, the, the, the one thing you, we've been bumping this in, we've been bumping into this a lot in the marketplace on, on the 409A, but one solution that we've seen is um, a cap, cap table management uh, software platform. And some of those do offer either um, components of the 409A, which if you went down that path, we normally will consult the client in going through that process um, there. And again, uh, the, the, that's normally where you do need a, or want a cap table because you're gonna track everyone, not just the options, but the investments, um, additional dilution that you anticipate going into the future. So just, uh, and we have no stake in the ground. Our, our purpose is really to find the best solution for our clients um, to keep moving forward. So in regards to the 409A, we find ourselves doing more consulting work around that. Um, and if there's a cap table solution that can provide the 409A that's compliant with the IRS, that's a direction that we've seen uh, a lot of our clients using in the marketplace. Wonderful. And, you know, we have uh, about eight minutes left. So I wanted to, you know, definitely uh, open it up to the audience if they like to ask any questions. Uh, but in the meantime, can we talk a little bit about the impact of code section 280E on the valuations uh, for these type of companies? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and basically when we're looking, you know, recapping what I had described before, the value of a company is, is, the value of the future cash flows after taxes to, to, to its owner. That's what the owner's buying. And what 280E does is, is you know, at a real high level, it basically makes, uh, it has a, a trafficking company or, or, you know, a company selling high THC cannabis. It has to pay their taxes at the gross margin level as opposed to the net income level. So it just pays a lot more taxes, therefore reducing um reducing the cash flow that would that would be available to the owners and then therefore reducing reducing the value um and then you know maybe one additional comment that, that i would have is is you know, when you're doing the the market approach remember that's when you compare um, may, maybe a, a similar company um that that has sold and, and a lot of times that, that when you're doing a market approach you use a metric like what what was the, the sales price as a ratio of the total revenue of that company? Sometimes I'd be leery about that with a 280E company because that completely disregards, you know, what, what the 280E pack impact is because it doesn't look at any of the, 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 the operating cost, only looks at revenue. And, and maybe the, the subject company is, um, it, it's a, you know, a retail that has an excessive amount of, of marketing type costs. And accordingly, 280 is just going to absolutely hammer this company because none of these marketing costs are, well, you, you get no deductions. So, um, and certainly none of the marketing costs would be. So then that, that would really drive down what their after tax cash flows would be. So the, the, the revenue multiplier might not be all that relevant. So. But uh, one, one thing you make me think of though, Calvin, is again, you, you've got market conditions versus uh, what the business valuation, yeah. the, um, the rules that we have to follow in doing a, a valuation. And what comes to mind is um, where you might have in a, in a particular market, I'm thinking Colorado, probably not current just because the um, price pressure over production again, but in a marketplace where someone, they just want additional um, the ability to grow more plants. So they'll be out there, they'll buy some licenses um, uh, to get the 5,000 or 10,000 more plants to grow. Or they might be looking at, hey, we need four more dispensaries. These are key market areas that we want to expand into so that we could sell off our product that we're producing so in, in those cases, you might see 
where the rule of thumb, I think Jim's always mentioned is, you know, 0.8 to 1.2 of revenue. And that, that could be the, the outcome that you sell for, but it's more because again, it's a strategic buyer that has uh, reasons to deploy or make that investment to expand either cultivation manufacturing or the retail footprint. Agreed, agreed. Well, uh, you know, we're wrapping up here and I just wanna thank you both gentlemen, uh, Calvin uh, and Corey for all your insights. It was very knowledgeable and informative webinar. You know, we're getting a lot of comments from the guests here uh, how much they enjoyed it. Uh, and, you know, they'll be watching the, you know, if you didn't have a chance to watch the full webinar today, you know, we will be emailing you the full session uh, tomorrow. So you feel free to, to reference back and, and, you know, be sure, you know, if you're, if you're in the business of, you know, you're in need of evaluation, or if you need to, you know, look at your multiples as a business, uh, you know, Calvin and Corey are both uh, more than qualified in the cannabis industry, you know, working with Bridge West. Uh, and you know, they've shared all their insights today on, you know, what it takes to, you know, why it's important to get evaluation, kind of the, the steps in the process in doing so, the different approaches as far as asset, income, and market approaches. And then uh, we also touched on 409A and 280E. So, you know, thank you, gentlemen, for all the insights that you shared today. Is there anything else that you'd like to add or any, uh, anywhere that people can find you uh, to reach out to, to book a meeting? Um, yeah, may, may, may first uh, say again, thank you, Guillermo, for this opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciated the opportunity. And also thank you to all the, um, the participants who, who tuned in to listen and, and contributed some questions. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, the best way to reach us probably through, through our website, um, Bridge West, and that would have our contact information. So, and I, I, somebody just put it on the, the uh, comments. So thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Again, thank, thanks. And um, again, if you just go to our website, there's a schedule button. Um, there no, um, no fee associated with that, but if you do that, just provide your name, address, uh, our, our admin will schedule a meeting um, to see how we might be able to help you. Again, thank you for um, joining us today and, um, and hosting us. Always. Thank you, Corey. Uh, and once again, my name is Guillermo Bravo, signing off here with MediaGel. You know, MediaGel is a cannabis marketing platform that connects brands and retailers with cannabis consumers through our ad network of mainstream publishers, mobile apps, games, and TV. So, you can advertise cannabis compliantly to you know, 21 up audiences on mainstream media like ESPN, uh, Sports Illustrated, GQ, you know, dating, gaming apps, everything. So just want to make sure that everyone knows that and uh, they're aware of your capabilities available uh, in the cannabis space. And thank you again. Uh, you know, catch, the, catch the team here on bridgewestcpas.com and mediagel.com on our side. All right. Take care.